Hello my friends, my name is Artur Ray and I am an Estonian YouTuber. Welcome back to my channel. Now you might have seen my military videos. There are many, there are many, most plentiful. The links are all in the description below and they're super cool. But today we're gonna do a historical video. We're gonna talk about the USA history and the Soviet Union history. Uh, more specifically, the Cuban Missile Crisis. I wasn't even a baby, I wasn't even, uh, I didn't even exist on an idea when this happened. My parents didn't even exist. So this is two generations before me, but I've studied a lot about it. And it's pretty darn interesting. But we have a letter from USA! Yes, uh, recently Americans sent me more letters than every, any other nation. It was different before. When I was in LA, Europeans sent me letters. Last time we ate Polish candy and now I have here Finnish candy. Oh, I'm excited. Let's take this one open. Let's see what's inside. Now, Americans send me letters when I'm in Europe. Let's open it. This letter is from a child because it looks like a child did it, which is fine and cool because only children do send me letters. If you want to send me letters, the address is here. Estonian flag, yes. From Uku. Uku is an Estonian name, so I'm pretty sure this is uh, an American Estonian. And all American Estonian or Canadian Estonians, if you're watching me, I've been to 10 Estonian houses and embassies in the uh, US. I performed in every one of them, in the biggest one. Let me tell you, I was in Lakewood, Estonian house, New York, Estonian house, Washington, Estonian house, Chicago, Estonian house, LA, Estonian house. <laughs> Kolme neile tunni pärast juba algabki. Tänu Chicago eestlaste tublile tööle näeb meie lava välja tõesti suursugune nagu Broadway. Ja olemegi valmis New York lastele ja eelkõige New Yorki eestlastele pakkuma nii põnevust kui naeru. Väga, väga põnev. Põr laha oli fantastiline. And I visited many Estonian Americans, rich and poor. We had great parties and we sang Estonian songs. So yeah, I know your life there. And I know you there, I like you there, and actually you guys helped me a lot while I was in the USA, so shout out to you. Letter says... Ter Artur, I am from Estonia. I love your videos. I'm in second grade. Yes, you are, little Timmy. I mean, Uku. My name is Uku. Treyat. Hey, you have sent me letters before. I'm not from Idaho, but I live there. I'm eight years old. You should play more Call of Duty 1. Hey, I should. I requested that you should watch the Italian invasion of Abyssinia. Bye. If an eight-year-old knows about the Italian invasion of Abyssinia, he must be Estonian. Little Luku, thank you for your letters. If you know any more Estonian Americans, I greatly believe that we are one nation and even if you don't speak Estonian anymore, you're still my brother. So yeah, thank you. The Cuban Missile Crisis with a nice cup of tea from a very godly Estonian YouTuber cup. Oh, look at it! You should get one of those. Only Americans get them, I don't know why. Maybe Europeans don't like the design. Maybe it's too plain for Italians who want, I don't know, Ferrari on their cup. Well, this is nice Estonian cup. If you're from USA, go and get it. Yeehaw! Oh, damn. 1962. Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev is walking near his villa on the Black Sea. He looks across the water. On the far shore is Turkey, where, months before, President Kennedy had stationed nuclear missiles. Their Ooh. warheads threaten Moscow. Oi. And he wonders, why then can't we do the same in Cuba? This is a smart thought for Nikita Khrushchev, because Khrushchev only had three grades of education. So little Uku, who sent me letters, was on third, second grade. Only one more year, and this would be Nikita Khrushchev. He never finished any education. He was, a, he was not an educated man, and he was with short temper, so... This thought here is very, it requires an applaud from him because it was not very smart, man. And the world slips one minute closer to midnight. Ooh. The midnight clock. This is still the time when extra credits made good videos. For the next few weeks, we're going to talk about the Cuban Missile Crisis. Yeah. A time when, for 13 days, two great powers hurtled toward a global suicide pact. And it started with a bluff. Following the launch of Sputnik in 1957, Sputnik. Khrushchev had regularly bragged to foreign press about the Soviet missile system. His rockets could hit a fly 8,000 miles away, he said, and Moscow was cranking them out like sausages. In reality, though, his intercontinental missiles were super inaccurate and took hours to launch. 
In the event of a war, they'd probably be destroyed while fueling, meaning that they weren't much of a deterrent against an American first strike. Yep. These long-range missiles... The whole Cold War was a bluff. Much more from the Soviet side than the Americans, because the Americans had what they say they have. But even the Americans bluffed a lot in the Cold War. Especially the Star Wars program. Did you know the Star Wars was a program before the movie came out? Or was it after? I don't know. Well, it was a real program, which ended the Soviet Union, basically. Anyway, they all bluffed. They all made coast castles. Uh, and the others believed it. Actually, they did. Those were a little more than an empty threat. But Khrushchev did have reliable medium and intermediate range missiles, and if he could station those in Cuba, he could credibly threaten the United States in much the same way NATO had encircled and threatened the Soviet Union. From that position of power, he could probably negotiate for Berlin, or demand that Kennedy withdraw his missiles from Turkey. And, as a bonus, the US would never again dare to invade Cuba. But deploying them openly was not an option. Couldn't risk Kennedy doing something rash. No, Khrushchev would have to sneak them in, and only unveil them once they were operational. It would be a checkmate, provided the secret held. On an undisclosed date in Havana, Fidel Castro sits in his office. The man across from him, traveling undercover as an agricultural engineer, is the head of Soviet rocket forces. And he's just offered to deploy <laughs> nuclear missiles in Cuba. Castro is skeptical. If the Yankees discover a secret deployment, they'll think that the missiles are intended for a first strike. Besides, Cuba doesn't need nuclear weapons, and he wants to look like a Soviet ally, not a puppet. Wouldn't a defense treaty be better? The Russian says no. These weapons will counteract imperialist aggression, protecting both nations. Castro withdraws to confer, and then delivers- I mean, about Castro, he's also weird, weird cake or weird monkey. Look, uh, in Salmonella Academy, yes, I know all of the channels. You say to me, Arthur, watch this channel. It's good about history. I've seen it. I watch all of the channels. Well, Salmonella had made uh, Castro's dairy addiction. He had a dairy addiction. He had like a lot of cows to make a lot of milk. He loved milk. He drank a lot of it. It's, it's so weird. Castro was a weird dude. Nikita Khrushchev was a weird dude. Two weird dudes get together and they put missiles on Cuba. That's very bad. And then Kennedy was a cowboy. Like we had weird people running countries back then. Here's his answer. Cuba will help defend world revolution. Khrushchev will have his Caribbean fortress. On August 25th in Sevastopol, a timber freighter pulls out of port, riding high on the water. Deep in its hold lie medium-range rockets, so long that they have to be propped up against a bulkhead. It's only one of 85 commercial ships ferrying troops and equipment to Cuba. The luckiest of these soldiers travel- Wait a minute, how many, how many of these missiles fit into one timber carrier? Like are they that small? I don't get it. On cruise ships disguised as tourists, but the majority are crammed into sweltering freighters. By early September, the missiles begin arriving. And they're not alone. 42,000 Soviet troops come ashore, dressed Whoa. in civilian clothes or Cuban army uniforms. They unload their cargoes by night. Helicopters, bombers, patrol boats, anti-aircraft guns, fighter jets, and medium-range ballistic missiles. This is the closest Soviet Red Army has gotten to the US after World War II has ended. I think this scared the hell out of the US. You're living your nice, peace, imperialistic capital life, you have everything you need. Suddenly there's 40,000 Red Army men very close to you with missiles. I would freak the hell out. These people are crazy. They are crazy. If you're from USA, I confirm Russians are crazy. So yeah, you were, um, you were right to be afraid. Missiles. The work begins. On October 16th at 11.50 a.m. in the Oval Office, President Kennedy and a handful of advisors sit at the briefing table, looking at blown up photos from a U-2 spy plane. A CIA analyst lays it out. These are medium range missiles with a range of 1,174 miles. If Ooh. one launches, it can hit Washington in 13 minutes. Kennedy is furious at Khrushchev's betrayal. Khrushchev! The midterms are coming yeah, up, and this... his political rivals have made the Soviet buildup in Cuba a campaign <laughs> issue. They accuse him of letting the Soviets install missile platforms 90 miles from Florida. Privately, Khrushchev had told Kennedy that the build- Yeah, if you're living in Florida, you place basically two hour drive away from 40,000 Red Army men. I mean, we in Estonia, we're almost always that far away from Russian troops. We're used to it, but Americans, I don't think you're used to it. And no offense, but still, it's 
They can be intimidating. Build up was defensive, meant to avoid another American invasion, and that it wouldn't include missiles. With this assurance in hand, Kennedy had drawn a red line, pledging to take action if the Soviets stationed nuclear weapons in Cuba. He had made that pledge, uh. thinking that he'd <laughs> never have to go through with it. When will they be operational? Kennedy asks. The analyst replies, once the warheads are attached, within hours. The defense secretary cuts in. If there's gonna be an airstrike, it must happen before the missiles are operational. But there is evidence that the warheads aren't on site yet. He thinks that Kennedy still has time to plan. But the chairman of the Joint Chiefs disagrees. Most of the rocket infrastructure is already in place. He thinks that the president should either order an airstrike or maybe an airstrike followed by an invasion. We are certainly going to do option one, says Kennedy. We are gonna take out those missiles. They Ooh. reconvened that night. Airstrike! Airstrike! That would mean full out war. 40,000 troops, you attack them. Bombardment? Dang, no, 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 no. Florida would be bombed to pieces, I think. That's the closest. 30 p.m. in the White House. Gathered around in the cabinet room are 14 men. Nine from the National Security Council and five other key experts. It's the first meeting of what will be known as the Executive Committee of the National Security Council, or XCOM. Kennedy secretly turns on a tape recorder, preserving the meeting. The Joint Chiefs state their unanimous position. An airstrike on the missile sites won't work. The tanks are rolling by again. Damn it. They're always doing it while filming the video. The war is gonna be fine. This is capped. She's not afraid of tanks. And she's fine. She will sleep through them. Can you sleep through rolling tanks? I don't think so. Be like cat. Sleep through tanks. You cute cat, go back to sleep. Khrushchev could just send more missiles to replace the destroyed ones, and Soviet bombers in Cuba could still hit Florida. They recommend 800 sorties destroying all Soviet power on the island, followed by an invasion. Kennedy's brother, Bobby, the Attorney General, loves this plan, because- Destroying all Soviet power on the island. That would mean killing 40,000 Red Army men and destroying a lot of equipment plus the Cuban, Cuban casualties. It would mean like 50 to 60,000 dead. Yeah, that would be third world war. He hates Castro. But the others point out that airstrikes are never 100% effective. Some Russian missiles might survive it and launch a counterstrike. And of course, if Soviet soldiers are manning the missiles, killing them in an airstrike could lead to war. The Secretary of State asks whether doing nothing is an option. After all, those missiles don't really change the strategic balance. Is getting nuked from Cuba any different than getting nuked from Russia? Kennedy agrees <laughs> it isn't. But he had pledged to take action, and if he reneges, Khrushchev might see it as weakness and start sending missiles to hotspots everywhere. So three plans <laughs> You get a missile! You get a missile! Even you get a missile! <laughs> Oprah handing out missiles like Khrushchev. ...are developed. First, diplomacy. Low chance of success, but low risk of war also. Second, instituting a naval blockade to stop any more weapons from coming in, and calling for the missile's removal. Publicly warned that any offensive move against the US would lead to a nuclear strike on the Soviet Union. Third, an airstrike with an optional invasion. XCOM goes back and forth, debating possible outcomes, but Kennedy keeps coming back to Khrushchev's thinking. Why would he do this? It would be like the US putting missiles in Turkey. Um, we did, points out the National Security Advisor. On October 17th <laughs> at 12 p.m. Yeah, I mean, if you do it to them, they will do it to you. That's how it goes. Even Jesus said it. If you, what you do to others, they will do it to you. Basically the same thing. <laughs> Everybody knows that. ...in the Caribbean. 40 U.S. warships plunge toward a Whoa, tiny island. 40. The Marines inside check their weapons. Soon they'll storm ashore and remove the island's dictator. It's just an exercise, one that was scheduled before the crisis. But in Washington, XCOM is still discussing whether they'll do this for real. On October 19th at 9.45 a.m. in the White House, the new intelligence reports are ominous. Fresh U-2 photos show two medium-range missiles are now operational. The Soviets are also building several launch sites for intermediate-range missiles that can hit almost all of the continental U.S. Those missiles aren't ready yet, but the decision window is closing. In the last several days, discussions in XCOM have increasingly turned away from the airstrike invasion option. Even Bobby has come around on that one. The blockade, at least, leaves room to negotiate. But the Joint Chiefs still push for war. 
Kennedy expresses his biggest concern. If he attacks- I mean, war and invasion and bombardment are the same thing. Whichever of those three you do, it's war. So, yeah. I don't think that is an option. That, that If you don't want the destruction of the whole world, it's not an option if you have, you have nuclear weapons. It's not at all. Tax Cuba, Khrushchev will attack Berlin, and that'll leave only one alternative, a nuclear strike. The Air Force Chief of Staff pushes back. If it came to it, they could wipe out the Soviets. Besides, a blockade will communicate weakness. He compares it to Nazi appeasement, which is a shot at Kennedy's father, who once advocated negotiating with Hitler. But Kennedy knows that winning a nuclear war might still mean millions of American deaths. The general responds that the Air Force will be ready for an attack in two days, if ordered. These brass hats have one advantage, Kennedy says after the meeting. If we listen to them, none of us will be alive later to tell them they were wrong. He <coughs> needs to make a decision. On October- Kennedy was smart. Hell yeah. 20th at 9 a.m. in Cuba, the 79th Missile Regiment gathers around a political officer. He stands on a mound of dirt brought from the Soviet Union, a reminder that these men are here to defend their homeland. He makes an announcement. Their eight medium-range missiles are combat ready. We may die martyrs, he says, but we won't abandon Cuba to the imperialists. His troops applaud. Ura, On October yes, 22nd at 10 p.m. in the Kremlin, Khrushchev has received intelligence reports of unusual activity all over the U.S. Congressmen are apparently boarding Air Force jets back to Washington, naval maneuvers are happening in the Caribbean, and civilians are evacuating Guantanamo Bay. Kennedy is scheduled to broadcast a television address at 2 a.m. Moscow time. The U.S. Embassy has told him to expect a communication an hour before. Khrushchev calls a meeting of the Presidium, the highest committee of the Communist Party. The missiles have been discovered, he says. An invasion of Cuba is imminent. He runs through his options, from announcing a mutual defense pact with Cuba over the radio, to transferring the missiles to Cuban control and letting them defend their own country. The best course, he says, is to disallow Soviet troops from using the long-range missiles, but permit them to use their short-range tactical nuclear weapons in the event of an invasion. His defense minister, Malinovsky, cuts in. Putting that decision in the hand of commanders might accidentally precipitate a conflict. He suggests waiting for Kennedy's message. It arrives an hour before Kennedy- They're like barking dogs. They all bark, 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 but actually when it comes to attacking, none of Neither of them wants to do it. Not the US, not the USSR. It's like they just yell at each other and make huge moves, and but they don't want to attack. Never they do. It's a game. It's all a game. It's bluff, maybe a poker, you know, you bluff. If you truly want to destroy others, you don't bluff, you just go in and destroy them. That's how aggressiveness works. But if you want to make a huge game out of it, you hang a huge bell on it, like everybody needs to know. That's the rules of the game, and if you know them, you can play very good on in, in the game. And they both knew them, actually. They both, Khrushchev and Kennedy both knew they... Attacking was the least thing ne neither of them wanted to do. But they had to look like they were ready to do it immediately. But they were not, neither of them were ready. Kennedy's broadcast. Not an invasion, but an ultimatum. There'll be no war tonight, but also no sleep. Because there are 14 Soviet freighters inbound for Cuba right now. One carries nuclear warheads three times more powerful than all the bombs ever dropped in history. And it is heading toward an American blockade. Ooh, Ay, a lot of good content coming from there. Yeah, I think we're gonna go, gonna go through with this course. It's three parts, I think. It's gonna be cool as hell. I'm sure in the US you have grandparents who know about this crisis. I mean, your parents probably were um, very young or not born yet. So your grandparents know this perfectly. So if you ask them, they can tell you what the US government told them, how they had to, you know, prepare for the bunkers to go and hide from nuclear threat. In Soviet Union, all you, all you did was put on a gas mask and go under the table. And sometimes there were big bunkers. Like from the first grade up, first grade children had to learn how to dismantle a Kalashnikov and how to put on a gas mask. And this was the nuclear threat, this is how they deal with it. Just go under a table or go in this huge uh, wartime bunker which didn't hold anything. Like when I, first to ninth grade, our sports facility was an ex-bunker, uh, nuclear bunker or a war bunker. 
built for that purpose but then it was turned into a sports facility. So yeah, it's, it's weird. I've trained like nine years in one of those. Looks like hell, it doesn't look good at all. There's low ceilings, I couldn't even do high jump there. I almost jumped to the ceiling. Yeah, Soviet Union was weird. If you like my Estonian perspective, Estonian view on this, Estonia didn't really have a say in any of this because we were in the Soviet Union, but still I can give my view to it. And as much as I know about it, uh, then please, yeah, support the channel. Become a patron of this channel. I want to read you a name who has got the cup. You can get this cup also. The link is in the description. And every time someone does it, I read the name. Just it's it's uh, it's a name goes on, and I will give the paper to the gods, and they will bless the guy because it's or or girl because but no girls have ordered yet. Justin Royce, thank you, Justin Royce. You drive a Rolls Royce? Ah, that's a lame joke. Anyway, thank you, Justin, for getting the cup. Very cool. You want to get the cup also? Follow the link in the description below. Become a Patreon, and as always, my friends, until my next video, stay cool and bye bye.